All right, so, ladies and gentlemen, uh, we have now reached our final segment uh, of the afternoon, and this is a good one, folks. Um, our next speaker is a veteran of the venue and live entertainment space who will address, among other things, how live or the live entertainment industry is changing along with increasing expectations uh, and new tech-savvy audiences in our final segment of the afternoon called Live and Loud. Um, before we introduce him, though, I'd like to also introduce a personal hero of mine. He's a favorite here at uh, Music Matters and All That Matters. Uh, he's up there with the likes of Jagger Slash uh, and Tyler. He's a true rock and roller. Uh, he's going to be interviewing today Mr. Ralph Simon. He'll be interviewing Jay Marciano from AEG. Thank you, thank you, thank you. We've got a fantastic opportunity for you all to learn a lot. Because this afternoon, this might be the closing session of the day, but it is definitely going to be the most interesting. And it is with supreme pleasure that we welcome Jay Marciano to the stage. Please give Jay a warm welcome. The last one wasn't so good. Here we are. So as you can see from that, uh, the slide right there, uh, Jay has come all the way from Los Angeles to come here to Singapore. And Jay is someone who is a human doing, not a human being. That is for sure. And the reason that he is, is because Jay is running a fleet of businesses that everyone here knows as AEG. Those of you who don't know about AEG, we'll show you in the next few minutes exactly why this is so important. So Jay, welcome to Singapore. Thank you for having us, Rob. Yeah, welcome to Asia. And uh, just to give you some kind of measure of Jay and Jay's background, I thought that it would be an interesting thing to just have a look at the pathway that led Jay to the stage here today. So 18 years at Universal Concerts, a division of MCA, the, which became the father of Universal Studios. You basically ran planned concerts, the Universal Amphitheater, famous concert venue where you basically saw every possible act every band, every well-known performer coming through there, comedians, rock bands, you name it. You were there for 18 years. The company was then taken over by the House of Blues. You then go and run globally the House of Blues. You then uh, become the chief strategy officer of AEG Live. So after those 18 years, what made you decide to join AEG? Well, at some point, my company was sold off to uh, some private equity guys. And if you've ever been around some of the private equity guys, they put a lot of debt against the business and made it very difficult to grow House of Blues. So at that point, I made a decision to leave House of Blues. And uh, AEG, which was just a startup at that point, was putting together their music company. And uh, Phil Anschutz and Tim Laiwicki gave me a call and said, you know, would you like to come over here and help us run our businesses? And I said, you know, I've been running businesses now for the last 18 years. I think I'm going to take a little time off, but I'm happy to consult with you on how to grow the business and what, what, where the investment should be made. And at that point, uh, they said, well, let's come up with a title. And we, they, they came up with this chief strategy officer title, which sounded, you know, wicked to me. It's like, oh, I'll talk about strategies. And uh, spent a couple of years there before I was recruited by uh, MSG to go run the Madison Square Garden and Radio City Music Hall. So you go to New York City, uh, you had originally come from Denver, from Colorado at any rate. You go to New York City where you're now effectively the president of Madison Square Garden Entertainment, booking Madison Square Garden, how many seats, 26,000? No, it's 18,000 18, seats. Yeah, booking Radio City Music Hall, Yes. the Beacon Theater, yes. a theater in Chicago. Chicago Theater, yes. Big venues, and of course, uh, Madison Square Garden is just a fundamental temple of entertainment in New York City. And there you are, booking in some of the greatest acts in the world, deciding what's going to go into Madison Square Garden. Yes. I mean, it, you make it sound as though it's, it's so easy. It's, it's not that hard. <laughs> no, not that hard. No, listen, when you're talking about Madison Square Garden and Radio City Music Halls, these are venues that are aspirational. I think artists grow up hoping someday that they're going to be able to play first Radio City, and if they succeed there, then go on to the, the garden. You know, one of the things that we acquired during my time there was the Beacon Theater, which was, you know, run down. That's in New York City. New York City, 2,500-seat theater. And the company was willing to spend tens of millions of dollars fixing it up. And, you know, so when you've got those three venues where you're able to provide that kind of a career path for an artist, 
you're starting with them at, at 2,500 seats and, and hopefully working their way up to Radio City and then, of course, the garden. And the beauty of the garden is that everybody brings their A game to play there. It's, um, if there's going to be a special guest anywhere on the tour, it's likely to happen in New York City at Madison Square Garden. It's got a 135-year history. It's, we're actually on garden uh, you know, version four, if you really want to look back through the history of the garden. But all the great events that have played there, I think Boxing, every- Boxing, entertainment, yeah. political conventions. The Pope. The Pope. Even the Pope plays Madison Square Garden. He sells tickets? <laughs> you can't get them. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what the secondary market is for the Pope's tickets these days. I'm going to have to look that one up. So from there, you then decide that you want to move out of New York City and you decide you're going to move to Europe. You go to London. And over the next few years, as the president and CEO of AEG Europe, you're responsible for building, well, not building, but certainly building the reputation of the O2, the venue in East London, which now has become the most important venue in the world in terms of tickets, revenues as a venue globally for live entertainment. Right. I think that I've been really fortunate to have worked with such great venues. You're coming from Madison Square Garden, Radio City, and then you're able to go to the O2. I think my, when I saw the O2 numbers, my self-esteem couldn't handle that the garden was going to be number two and that yeah. the O2 was going to be number one. So I said, I have to go to number one, right? right. And... Um, Fortunately, we, we not just have the, the O2 in Europe, we've also have the number one and number two arenas in Germany, in Berlin and in Hamburg, the number one arena in Scandinavia with the Globe. So you're working with outstanding assets, you're working with great promoters in each of those markets that are strong and knowledgeable, and you've got a great team of people there to pull together. So this whole notion of AEG, and AEG, a lot of people don't know what AEG stands for, but it's Anschutz Entertainment Group. So here's a picture of you uh, vending forth the strategy while you're in London. I don't know where that was taken, but clearly you're thinking about how you're going to get some more box office revenues. I think I was probably talking to Emma Banks on a panel somewhere at that Emma point. Emma Banks, the well-known agent, is going to be speaking here in the next, next couple of days. But here is an important character who is the A in AEG. Who's that? That's Phil Anschutz. So Phil is... Uh, a fascinating man, an incredible character, who lives most of his time in Denver and Colorado, started life as an oil wildcatter looking for oil, then acquired a railroad company, and then on a desolate piece of land in the center of Los Angeles decided that he was going to construct something, which is that building that is behind him in that picture. And you work very, very closely with Phil on a daily basis, basically planning out the strategy of AEG on a global basis and worldwide. Right. If you follow Phil's career, you'll see that he starts with businesses and ends up you know, backing into opportunities that probably aren't obvious to, to, to most people. When he was in the railroad business, uh, long before it became um, commonplace to do this, he started laying fiber optic cable along the railroad lines and created a telecommunication company called Quest. But the acronym for Sprint at the time was Southern Pacific Railroad and Telegraph. And that's where you know, he started the telecommunications business. It looked like a railroad business, but it turned into something much bigger than that. In the case of uh, Staples and AEG, his wife was a hockey fan and tried to buy a hockey team in Denver, Colorado, and that deal didn't go through. When the, uh, the Kings in Los Angeles became available, who were playing at the Forum at that time, he acquired the Kings, realized he needed a new arena, and then went and bought a property in, in downtown Los Angeles at a time when nobody was going downtown. Nobody would think to buy property in downtown Los Angeles. I'd lived there for 20 years, and I think I'd probably count on one hand the number of times that I'd been downtown in Los Angeles. And we all thought, most of us thought, well, this is, a, this is a crazy idea. Nobody's going to go downtown. But he built Staples Arena. And one of his business models... That Staples models, in that picture there right in the front. Now, this is a model showing a number of different buildings, one of which is not there. It's the, the, big, uh, the big one at the Farmers back. Field. Yeah. But Staples was built, as you mentioned, was the first one. And then he built a huge cinema complex, plus the Nokia Theater, which Nokia paid rights to name and effectively built this huge downtown entertainment city. When I first met with Phil, you know, like most of these guys, they can explain their business plan 
on a, on a napkin. So Phil literally took out a piece of paper and he says, here's what we're gonna do. We're gonna build this big arena. We're gonna put it down in the middle of this property. I bought up all this land around here. We're gonna sell off pods on the outside of this land and we're gonna take that cash and we're gonna reinvest it in the center and we're gonna create an entertainment district. And not only have we done this in Los Angeles and on land that nobody thought that could be done, but we did it in East London when everyone thought we were crazy, and we did it in East Berlin when everyone was thought was crazy. So this idea of trying to buy up distressed property, anchoring it with something like an arena, and then building an entertainment district around that with hotels and restaurants and nightclubs and other music venues is all concept that just came out of his head of, well, I want to do something more than own sports teams and own an arena. I want to create you know, a lifestyle and a district for people to come to. So what we'll do is uh, I want to take you through some things. I mean, that just gives a picture of Los Angeles that you can see on the screen there. And actually, talking about Staples Center, this is a picture from one of the most televised events of all time on television, where the Michael Jackson funeral was actually held at Staples Center. There's uh, Michael Jackson's casket in the front, the whole family standing behind there. I mean, who would have thought a Michael Jackson funeral at Staples Center? No one obviously imagined that at the time, but... Ken Ehrlich, the guy that does the Grammys, is now part of your company, uh, produced the funeral, and the funeral did got such incredible global uh, appeal. So I uh, wanted to just bring some idea of some of the uh, venues in Asia and in China that you guys are very involved with. Here is the MasterCard Center in Beijing, and your team run by uh, Adam Wilkes and... John Capo. And jo John, yes. uh, who clearly are developing the whole world of AEG in this part of the world. And you work very closely with them, guiding the overall strategy of what you want to achieve. We just have a great team here in Asia. John Capo has lived in China for 30 years. Adam Wilkes has lived there for 15 years. Um, the venue business and the concert business that we've built up over the last couple of years comes directly on the backs of their experience. And this is, you know, the beauty, I think, one of the, one of the top arenas in the world, the Mercedes-Benz Arena in Shanghai. And we have uh, built up over the last seven or eight years a track record of bringing Western music to China when everyone thought that that was maybe not such a great idea. And so in this process, the whole idea of building entertainment districts rather than just a venue, rather than just an arena, is really something in the bigger picture because you're looking at stimulating a whole area economically, obviously getting the business benefits of doing that, but more importantly, really bringing something special into an area that needs construction or reconstruction. Like for example, in Dalian in China, here is a whole entertainment district where there's a stadium and arena. I mean, this is a, this is a massive undertaking and management uh, uh, issue that you've got to manage this process, make sure that people are buying tickets to go in and use it and so forth, working with local authorities, the local taxes. Uh, I mean, this is c complex stuff. It's, it's, it's complex, but the business plan is very simple, which is at the core of everything is the fan experience. The fan experience. It's at the core of it. It drives all of our, our business model. And when you look at it, if you even think about our festival business, it's about creating a great experience. And in many cases, and I like to say this, that in some cases with our festival business, the, the model's inverted, meaning that we bring the fans and then the artists play. In most situations, the artists have to sell the tickets. Right. In many of our festivals, we've created such a great environment, just as we have with our, with our arenas and our clubs and theaters and our regional offices throughout the world. We're now up, when you add up all, up all the uh, clubs, theaters, and arenas, uh, it's north of 100 that we have, and we're on five continents with big teams of people that operate them. Amazing. Incredible uh, way that it's done. I mean, you're even developing projects in Australia. Here's the All Phones Arena in Sydney, 21,000 seats. Here's the Suncorp Stadium in Brisbane, 52,000 seats. Big venue, certainly in Queensland. Here's something that's coming on stream in 2016, a new international convention center in Darling Harbor in Sydney. Those of you who know Sydney, uh, this is a beautiful architecture that's coming on stream. So all of this ties in with what you're doing here in Asia Pacific. For example, recently in Kuala Lumpur, you brought Ed Sheeran to KL. And it's just part of the wider strategy of bringing entertainment and bringing the uh, wider entertainment in terms of festivals, in terms of uh, large-scale entertainment to this part of Asia and Asia-Pacific. 
If you look through our venue portfolio, you'll see that in some cases we own and operate. We put up all the capital to build and operate. In some cases, we've got partners. We've got local partners. We have under construction in Las Vegas a brand new arena that will be opening um, in 2017. Our partner there is MGM, and that's a strong local partner that we're partnering with. We have the expertise on how to build and design and operate. They've got the local market expertise. We've come together. It's the same business model that we employ. We have a, a partner in China with OPG. But you, you did that at Caesars Palace, another famous casino venue in Las Vegas, where you uh, look after the Coliseum. We created the residency model. Uh, you, you created the residency where Celine Dion came in to open it, was incredibly successful. Elton John goes in there. You've recently had Rod Stewart in there. I mean, that in itself is one of the largest grossing venues for a major artist to go and perform, albeit six nights a week, five yeah, nights a, a week. it's a 4,000 seat theater that's doing $100 million a year in ticket sales. Oh, $100 million from a 2,000 seater? A 4,000 seater. 4,000 4, seater. Amazing. And this MGM arena that you're building, the, the one for 2017, is this all part of a kind of preconceived formula? How do, you, how do you sit down and work all these things out? I think we get much better with each, new, with each venue that we build. I think we get a lot better at it. The, the, the venue, for instance, in Las Vegas that we're building, we're doing things that you could only do in Las Vegas. We have two-story suites because you have to go bigger and better. We have Hakkasan doing the catering for all the sweet catering. Hakkasan is a big restaurant right. chain, very prominent right. in Las Vegas. But it's a localized experience for the Las Vegas audience. Right. And we know basically on the touring patterns of artists on the shows that are currently playing the MGM arena, what's playing Los Angeles, what's playing before that, you can fairly easily predict that how many shows it would be playing each, each year at this venue. So that also helps you in your negotiations with talent where you can say, okay, we would like to be doing something with, say, Muse, well-known rock group, and we will plan out some touring strategy, and you can basically see how it fits in with all of your buildings and basically try and do something that's best for fans, best for the talent, best for the managers. I mean, this is really the new music business in a sense, because you're really looking at capitalizing on live, which now is really the driver as much as the record business used to be. Well, for in the case of, I think you brought up Muse, we always sit down with artists in advance. We may not be the promoter of that, of that tour or that artist or that artist in that show, that specific uh -huh. show, but we're always looking to make sure that they're accommodated in our venues. So in the case of Muse, we might be talking to them about four shows at the O2, a show in Berlin, a show in Hamburg, and two shows in Los Angeles, and two shows in Las Vegas. But we're always looking at the total picture. Amazing. So. Taylor Swift is someone that you started working with some time back, an incredible young woman who's just basically turned 25, 26. Uh, this is uh, going back to 2014, but just last week, or the week before last, you had Taylor Swift opening in Tokyo. Uh, Adam Wilkes was there. Uh, Adam, is Adam in the audience here at the moment? Where's Adam? Is he there? I think he's uh, probably talking to Taylor Swift on the phone, but Taylor conquers Tokyo, which is true, isn't it? She did incredibly well in Tokyo just a week and a half ago. Well, she sold 100,000 tickets, which I think in oh. any market, that's a pretty staggering amount of, show, of tickets. Incredible. And uh, the, uh, she also introduced an incredible new stage device, which was basically a floating stage. She gave it a, this is a tough try to take all of your production over to Tokyo, set it up, and then ship it back. But that's what she wanted to give her fans. And she's got that kind of strength, both as an artist and as a creative artist, that if she wants to do something, she knows how to connect with her fan base in a way that very, very few artists today know how to do. I think all the artists are very involved in their shows. If you looked at Katy Perry, she was very involved with her show. I had the privilege of watching Katy rehearse for the Super Bowl this year, and down to every, you know, Every, every little diamond in the shoe or, you know, the shoes that were being worn, the wigs that were going to be worn. Those are all decisions that, that she personally made. And also working, of course, with great managers like Steve Jensen, who we'll be speaking to over the next couple of days here at uh, All That Matters. But uh, Taylor Swift in particular and the impact that she started to make in Asia Pacific, clearly she sees that the future for her is not only US orientated or Europe orientated, but she sees a focus on developing an audience in this part of the world. It's not just Taylor. I think that you know, the good news is we're seeing a, a whole crop of new artists that are 
intent upon having an international fan base. And it's really satisfying to take an Ed Sheeran, a Taylor Swift, a Katy Perry, and know that they are really thinking about not just their North American business or their European business, but their international business. If you sort of stack it up and look at the earnings of most artists that have an international career, you know, rounding here a little bit, but somewhere between 60 and 65% of the total income is still being generated out of North America. 20, 25% in Europe, and it used to be 5%, but it's pretty soon it'll be 15% of the total artist earnings will be generated in Asia. So, and that's the, that's the number that's growing, and that's a number that wasn't existent even 10 years ago, even three years ago. Amazing. So in the three years, there's been this definitive growth. I remember just a few years ago, uh, Avril Lavigne uh, was smart enough, guided by her very good manager, to record some choruses of her songs in Mandarin, which led her to have a good stadium audience in China. But would you say that there's been a considerable impact because of the digital revolution on acts, not just in this part of the world, but how has this digital revolution and social media changed the whole nation of audience development, audience growth? You know, it's, we've become a world of sharers. Right. So everything, every performance, every public appearance is being shared. Right. And it's being shared in a way, for instance, at Coachella, we, we track the social media, as, as a lot of people do, from coming out of Coachella. And the social media of a, the, the, of the, of a, a single performance is there's 100,000 people watching it live, and there's hundreds of millions of people that have been, been, been impacted by that performance. Do the artists allow that kind of uh, online activity to take place simultaneously with the shows? Well, I think not? everybody's doing it on their own device to start with. Uh, of course, that's right. And then, of course, we have at any one of our festivals, there's a dozen people curating things that are being posted in social media from every festival. So that we may be looking at 1,000 pictures and we pick 10 just like an editor would from, you know, it's putting out a magazine and put the best 10 pictures up. Right. So the whole notion of festivals we'll get to in a minute because that's a fascinating area where there's tremendous growth and we've got a bunch of things that we'll speak about in just a minute. But before we do, uh, here's a well-known quartet that uh, doing very well. Here's uh, Metallica in Macau, promoted by yourselves. You've been working with Metallica for some time. G good uh, clients to work with. You know, this is another artist that's later in their career have decided, let's go sort of break in some new territories. And this, uh, this past tour was the first time that they'd been to China. And they were well received. In China. They were well received in China. And uh, they'll be back. You know, the most important thing is, is that there's a lot more hand holding going on with artists coming over to Asia. And we're all still figuring this out together. How many shows? And as you would know, the venues, the venues that are existing in a lot of these markets aren't this, of the same quality or the right size or right production capabilities that you have, say, touring North America or Europe. But they're all willing to make the compromise and they're all willing to come over and make a big statement. And I think virtually every single artist that we've been working with that have taken the time to put the work in and come over and tour Asia are artists that will be back and will be back throughout the rest of their careers. So do you think it's, it's an important priority now for artists to be building an international fan base that looks at all of the continents in the world? I mean, Ed Sheeran, now successful pretty much all over the world. You really helped open that up for Ed Sheeran. He's playing three Wembley Stadium dates this coming summer in the UK. He's doing three big stadium shows in Australia where just a couple of years ago he had 40 people going to his first gig. So this worldwide following that obviously social media develops. Uh, do you think that this is now a function of most really successful artists that they've done that to build that international caucus? If they're willing to put the work in. They have to be willing to put the work in and you have to have an astute management team that understands the significance right. of growing an international fan base. But as I said a moment ago, more and more young artists are willing to do that. I'm gonna give you an, another extreme example. Yep. American country music. Yeah. American country music has not translated very well outside of North America. Right. Most of those artists, <laughs> we had a, a recent example where we, we gave a show to an artist uh, in London, and the artist says, I don't even have a passport. <laughs> so they have been making you know, a lot of money and have enjoyed long careers just touring the you know, 100 cities in the US and right. you know, going back to Nashville on the bus on the weekends. We created this event several years ago in London called Country to Country. 
and we said, we once again went against the grain. A lot of people said, you're crazy, let's not do, country doesn't work in London. And we created this vehicle for artists to come over. They get paid a fraction of what they make in North America, but they're willing to put the time in. And this new crop of Luke Bryans and Eric Churches and those types of artists that said, you know what? I want to have an international career. I'm willing to, you know, to make the time. So now we're able to take those artists not just to London. We're able to take them to Dublin. We're able to take them to Glasgow. We're able to take them to Norway and 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 Sweden. So we're able to help build these artists outside of what was traditionally thought as they're just North American artists. So great. So this really shows that the sense of internationalization, not just for American artists, but looking, for example, at K-pop and some of the Korean acts that have done well by going to America, Gangnam Style, Psy, being managed by Justin Bieber's manager, Scooter Braun in America. Obviously, there isn't all that much cross-pollination like that, but certainly for American, British, international acts, Singaporean acts, going to, uh, going to Asia is more common. Let's uh, look at this picture here because this is taken from three years ago. It's a poster advertising um, the first uh, Philippines performance uh, by Katy Perry and of course such great management such a great artist um, just this last week Katy Perry was back in the Philippines and this time the show was unbelievably successful you promoted it well look at this is another artist that's like I said a moment ago that's willing to put the work in willing to come over in, 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 early on probably at a expense to them you know, despite what we're paying them as promoters, these are artists that are probably losing money by the time they bring their show over on, the, on, their, on their early forays. But I think I just added up the other day, um, you know, there's $20 million worth of tickets sold on this last 12 dates that Katy, you know, Katy Perry played in Asia. $20 million, so that would be the Philippines, Indonesia, Jakarta. I mean, you could go through, you can go through the whole. Those, those the, territories. There were 12 dates. 12 dates. Yeah, two of which were in China. Right and the rest were you know, spread throughout Asia. And that probably wouldn't have been possible. Now, I, I, I look at this and go, okay, there's 12, when, when can we get it to 20? Right. How do we build it to that? Okay, so you looking at it from a strategic point of view, you'll sit down with the managers, Steve Jensen and Martin Kirkup, and you'll say, we've done 12, we've built a following, we'll use social media from this to spread the word, and you think that it's feasible that sometime over the next one to three years, she could reach 20? Venues? No doubt. There's no, I think she could have done more than the 12 that we did this time out. Right. And so when you sit down and talk to the managers about that kind of strategic planning, is it, is it hard to find managers who understand your thinking where you say, come on, guys, gals, this is what can work? You know, like promoters, managers come in all sizes and shapes, right? And they right. all have different experiences. Some are really good with just working with the labels. Some are, have, a, have a great live background. In the case of Steve Jensen, he started He's as an Katie agent. Katy Perry's manager. Katy Perry's manager. He's had a you know a career of touring artists internationally, you know, for 35 years. Wow! And so he has a deep understanding of what it takes to do that. Oh, he's a wonderful professor. There are other managers that sort of get it, but they haven't been out of Los Angeles very often. <laughs> so you know they're happy to say, "Listen, you guys go do this, and I may show up for a couple of dates." But right. they have a you know very limited understanding of of the international marketplace. So those really successful managers are the ones that embrace internationalism and embrace looking at Asia and saying, "This." is a group of territories where we feel we can really develop something with social media, with music that is contextually relevant to the area. It's clearly a whole new future area for harvesting some good dollars, good t-shirt sales, um, a whole range of different things. I think a lot of these young artists have had the benefit of you know, 50 years of rock and roll. Right. And they can look at those artists that have had sustainable careers for 50 years. Right. They can look at Elton John, they can look at Paul McCartney, they can look at the right. Rolling Stones. Right. And each one of those artists all had international careers. And they're all asking their managers, what does it take for me to have a career like that? So here's a poster of uh, Katie's show on the 1st and 2nd of May in Macau at the Venetian, the largest uh, horizontal architectured space in the world. Um, but clearly she did exceptionally well there as well as part of this touring cycle. Doesn't mean that you've got to do the Venetian and the casino in Macau, but it's just one of the different venues you can be doing in this part of the world. And just generally looking at the way that you broaden the reach of talent where the visual culture 
seeing, uh, seeing stuff on YouTube is also helping develop an artist's uh, impact internationally. Listen, from our standpoint, it's just closing the loop. When we're out here and we're working with an artist like Katy Perry and we see that there's 12 markets, but that there's a repeatable pattern of talent right. that is selling tickets in those markets year after year, right. and we can get a rhythm going, right. that's the next place we want to build a new arena. Oh, so, I see. You know, so you're I, really looking at this, you know, it's taking a lot of, 10, 15 year view. You have to. You have to look at it from, these are all long term plays. Right. And you have to have a lot of staying power to be able to do that. And but sometimes the biggest pioneer, the first in, is the talent, is right. the content. They're first in, they're establishing the market. If a market becomes established and we look for an opportunity, there's a place to build an arena. Sometimes we'll do it with our own money. Sometimes we'll do it with, in partnership. Sometimes we'll do it, there'll, there'll be a local municipality or a local business person that wants to build an arena that needs our expertise and we'll just be it on a, on a fee for hire basis. But every time we go in and we start to see it, that there's a pattern that we can start to bring and there's a tipping point of, you know, if you start getting up around 50, 60 shows, you can start thinking about a couple hundred million dollar arena. So your experience in taking this route from Staples Center, your own personal experience from Madison Square Garden, looking at Europe with the O2 and all of the European, you've, you've got a, a, an analog that you can work with in an incredible way that gives you some kind of playbook that you can develop these things. Let's uh, take a look at one of these things where you acquired a company called Golden Voice some years ago. Golden Voice had a number of festival properties you saw and spotted early on with your foresight, Jay, I know that you're very modest, but the truth is you decided to take an interest in Coachella. Uh, that's not you there in the space suit, I might add. But um, the point is that you decided to acquire that festival and Coachella today has got global significance. Yeah, I, I think that, listen, Coachella was, was, a, was, a, was a labor of love in the beginning and it's easy to say, look at it today and think, wow, it's one of the most successful festivals in the world. but. I will tell you that we probably lost money the first, you know, seven of the ten years that we were oh. we were with it. That's what staying power was about. We knew we kept we, we knew that we were onto something good. So wait, just explain to people who are not familiar here with Coachella what it is. It's in the middle of the desert, in just near Palm Springs, in a small town called Indio, and it's on a large field that has got a polo polo field. The polo fields. And that scene that you can see in that slide actually shows you the hills in the desert at dusk, which is a magical setting, because if you're there at sunset when the acts well, the acts play through through the day, it's on two weekends, right? Well we've got the advantage of having just and I think that's fundamental to most festivals, you have to have a unique setting. And we have a wonderful setting there. We have almost nearly perfect weather. You're, you're almost guaranteed perfect weather. Um, in the case of Coachella, after it sold out several years in a row, the first weekend, that well, would be 300,000 tickets, we did something that nobody thought was possible. We took the identical lineup and cloned it and did it the next weekend. And that weekend sold out as well. So you got 600,000 people over two weekends? Yes. Incredible. And what would the ticket price be for coming it's, to Coachella uh, today? $350 for the weekend which is probably the cheapest part of the weekend for most people. Wow. When you start looking at what they're spending in hotels, or even in our campgrounds, if you were to walk through the campgrounds, there's some like, oh, I you think- you can camp at uh, Coachella we, as well. We camp about 40% of the, of the people camp. 120 So there's a price point for everyone. If you want to sleep in your car, great. You want to camp out, that's great. You want to put six people in a hotel room, that's great. Or if you want a five-star experience, we have that as well. I mean, the business has grown so much and we start thinking about, you know, how to keep making it better. We're actually, we've been buying up property now for several years, you know, many, many, many acres that surround Coachella. And we're, we're going to actually, this is the first time we're going into home development, but we're building 12 homes around a community pool that will be a five-star experience where you rent the house for the weekend. We give you a chef, we give you the golf cart to come over, you have the VIP experience. And we, we started to think about this because we started looking at what people were, rent, were, what were paying to rent homes in the desert, you know, for the Coachella weekend. This is, it's a music experience that's become, frankly, a travel experience or... A rite of passage for many people it's from a, all over the, it, the world. It's a rite, of a rite of passage, but it's also a vacation. A vacation for many people. in the desert. Well, here's a scene uh, of part of the sellout audience, and that's just one of the areas because you have different stages at Coachella, right? 
Yeah, there's, there's six, six stages. Six stages, and in terms of the talent, you've got an electronic dance music component. The Sahara Tent, yes. This year you had ACDC, you even had those old farts, uh, Steely Dan, great farts that they might be. Uh, but, uh, careful now, careful. Uh, and in terms of uh, an Australian act from Melbourne by the name of Chet Faker, who apparently did really well. Yes. And this is just a segment of the 300,000 people on, on the weekend, incredible. It's a, it's a great success. We're, as a company now, we have 27 festivals. In the United States? In the United States. 27, including Jazz Fest in New Orleans. Correct. And which are some of the others that you know? Well, we, we, we just, just came back from Hangout this past weekend, which is in the Gulf Shores of Louisiana. There's 40,000 a day there, so 120,000 tickets sold there. Firefly, which may not be common knowledge to you guys, is now one of the top five festivals in the United States. That's going to do 80,000 tickets a day coming up, and that's in Delaware. But they, they come in all size and shape. Some of them are smaller festivals, some of them are mid-left festivals, and some are, you know, the big festivals. And I think that, you know, and we're going to, as a company, we're launching four more festivals next year. Uh, there'll be an announcement in the next couple of weeks about uh, a d an agreement that we've made with ISC, which controls all the NASCAR tracks in the U.S. And ISC have been putting hundreds of millions of dollars into the tracks to, once again, great, you know, deliver a great fan experience. So we, and they've got a great database because it's NASCAR. So that's a natural place to put country festivals. Oh, that's the, the car racing circuits yes. in America. Yes. So uh, is the technique of selling tickets for festivals completely different from indoor arenas and uh, even stadiums? Is it a completely different kind of discipline? It is. It's a, it's, uh, you know, I like to say that the average arena in North America might have 40 shows a year. If you had support acts, on, maybe they touch 80 artists, right? And the average amphitheater might have 30 shows, so maybe that's 60 artists. Right. You know, but some of our festivals have 250 artists. How, you mean so you're working a, 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 over a three-day weekend. Right, 250 right? Yeah. of the different genres of yeah. music. Yeah, yeah. Uh, with, with Jazz Fest, it's even more than that. Why is that? Well, because there's nine stages there, and you've got the gospel tent and the blues tent, and you add those all up, and they're constant, there's music going on constantly throughout that. And throughout how many day. people did you get going to Jazz Fest over the two weekends? We just, we just two weeks ago finished up. That was 420,000 people over the two ah. weekends. So you got 600,000 at Coachella, 420,000 in New Orleans, another 25 festivals just in the United States. Is this festival growth something that's happening all over the world? I know, for example, Glastonbury, which you don't have yet, is 178,000 people, which is less than Coachella. But are you seeing this uh, as an international development? Yeah, I think the experience is different in different parts of the world. Yeah. I think for 30 years, the North American summer outdoor experience was defined by amphitheaters. Right. Uh, in recent years, I think what we've, I think it reflects, my, it's my own personal thought on this, the growth in festival business in North America reflects how music fans consume music, which is they're doing a lot of grazing. They go, and they do it in a social way, and they right. want to do it with their friends. Right. So they might go see four songs with this artist. They might split up. And some people go off to this tent. Some people go to this other stage. They meet up for lunch, and they go, and it's a, it's a, you know, it's a social, very social way to, to, you know, to consume music. Right. And I think that's how... Most music fans are consuming music today. So this whole notion of shared experience, which is almost like an extension of social media and the digital sharing, the sharing economy, all of those things, people will combine to have a sharing experience and basically dip into different musical styles. And out of that will also come the new talent that hopefully will lead to headlining in amphitheaters or in stadiums and basically be the derivatives of the festival uh, planning that your team has to do creatively. Yeah, Coachella and Glastonbury are probably, you know, the exceptions because they sell out without having to announce talent. Right. They're probably the two festivals in the world that do that. Other festivals that are developed over, over periods of time will sell 50, 60 percent of their tickets just on the basis of the experience that we deliver. And maybe the talent has to sell the other 40 percent of the tickets. Huh. But once again, as I said a moment ago, these festivals are delivering big audiences for artists to play in front of. Right. They don't have to worry about going out and selling the tickets themselves. Right. They have to show up and, and deliver a really good show, so, and they have to win over that, you know, that audience. So give me an example of an act that you've seen at some of these festivals that just has come out of nowhere 
and done really. We mentioned Chet Faker, the Australian, but would someone like, um, let's say, some of the DJs in the EDM world, there's Cascade, who's signed to Warner Brothers Records, but um, who can you think of that all of a sudden came through as like a top favorite in one of these big festival yeah, events? We, we track audience preferences for all our festivals, and I don't think we're unique. Probably all festival pro you know, producers do this as well, but for Coachella, we have this thing called Co-Chooser. And, and Co chooser that, And what that is is, you know, through your app, you, we, we listen to the fans, and they sort of tell us, you know, what, you know, they rank their shows, top five shows, top ten shows. And we're constantly monitoring this, and on any given day, it can change a little bit, or hmm. could change a lot. And um, one of the things that we noticed this year after, the, uh, after we announced the lineup was The weekend was a top three artist. The band called The weekend. Yes. Right. And, um, you know, we'd already announced sort of, and you do this, frankly, just by font size, <laughs> yeah. who the big artists are, and it was ACDC, and it was Jack White. And The weekend was in a bigger font size than other. They were, they were scheduled to play before Jack White, but by the couple of weeks out, The weekend had far surpassed Jack White. So we had to make a tough call. It's rare that we have to do this, but... The weekend closed the Saturday night at Coachella. So you Jack have to White. tell Jack White's management, sorry guys, but the you, weekend are going to be closing and yes, you're not. Yes. How do you deal with that? Difficult. <laughs> Use, it's political persuasion? You have to say, listen, we've got the, we've got the, the data, data here to prove that. Now, I think Jack was a great sport about it and he said, I'm just going to go kill. And he did. He and delivered he did. a great show. Sometimes, you know, that's a good, you know, little kick there that, you know, have somebody come out and he killed it. He was fantastic. Yeah, such a great talent, great yes, artist. But, it, but it's one of those things that we didn't see, you know, before we put the show up. We didn't see that The weekend had grown that much in popularity. So effectively, you're using in your mechanism for determining public taste, a way of using data on all of these different data points, which actually corresponds with exactly what the audience sentiment suggests it should and could and must be. Everyone that attends one of these panels all talk about the data. It's all about big data. But it's also about what you can do with your data. And, That's key. And, you know, it's one thing to have, say, oh, we've got 5,000 or 5 million email addresses. It's a, another thing to know their preferences. It's their, another thing to know their willingness to pay. Are they the kind of customer that only wants to sit in the best seats and they don't care what it costs? Right. Are they a value customer? They don't care. They're just looking for a bargain, for a deal. Right. But it's all in the data management. And we've spent a lot of time. I wouldn't say we're perfect at it yet. I'd say we're getting really good at it. And, you know, 70% of the tickets throughout, throughout all of our uh, uh, venues right now are sold through the data and not through traditional media. So effectively, this becomes another arrow in the quiver of a promoter and the promoter's thinking in terms of how you effectively cover what's effectively a real risk business. This is an, a, a whole new skill set. It's expensive. You have to, there's no off-the-shelf software that you can go buy and say, if you use this software, you can deliver an audience. It's something that's done through a lot of trial and error, and it requires a lot of manpower to be able to manage this thing. So, for instance, in Los Angeles, we've got 25 data marketers, that's all they do, is they manage the data, data dogs. For, data dogs. Uh, if I call them that when I, when I, when I go <laughs> They'll back, I'll you. say that's Ralph's word, yeah. word for you. But uh, they're data marketers and they're really good at it and they understand how to give us a lot of data back on social media and the feedback that we're getting. So Jay, just in looking at all of the things that you've just touched on during the time that we've been speaking today, if you look at this slide here talking about the different kinds of entertainment venues that are really in your focal point. Entertainment districts, as you've very articulately described, uh, the notion of convention centers and arenas, the festival business, stadiums. You've got to take a long-term view, and insofar as your view, as far as Asia is concerned, basically all of these changes you're seeing manifesting on a global basis, social media, festivals, all of this kind of stuff, is helping shape what you strategically and AEG as a company will want to be doing in this part of the world? The, the, the beauty that we have is we're not a public company. AEG is a private company. I've, I've got to keep one guy happy. His name is Phil Anschutz. And Phil has a long-term view on everything we do. Anybody that hung in there with us for that many years of losses of Coachella, you know. Uh, seven to ten years, you yeah, said. Seven out of the first ten years, we lost money. You lost money for seven out of ten yeah, years. Yeah, yeah. So you got to have a lot of staying power to be able to do that. Right. Fortunately, he's the kind of uh, owner 
that is uh, debt averse. So we have very little debt and we're able to manage through, if we've got a down cycle, we're able to manage through that without having to go lay off 10% of the workforce or something like that. And also you believe in teamwork because you've had a really solid, stable team for some time of real great professionals who live, eat, breathe, and know the entertainment business. Just at AEG Live, forget the rest of it, there's a $100 million payroll a year. Oh. So that's a big payroll. Too. That's like you have to do a lot of tours. <laughs> You have to have a lot of venues, you have to have a lot of festivals, you have to have a lot of regional offices and clubs and theaters to be able to support a $100 million payroll and still return a decent return for our investor. So with Adam Wilkes and John, who's, you mentioned They're making earlier. like $15 million each, I think, of yes, that, right? <laughs> no, but the point is that they are really key, key executives for you in this part of the world and just terrific guys to work with, just knowledgeable, really knowledgeable about the whole region. So uh, it must be great for you to come to Singapore and be able to hang out with them and talk about basically how you're creating these new fan experiences. When I'm around Adam and John, I just mostly listen because there's a lot to learn. They've been in the market a long time. You know, if they, were, if they come over to Los Angeles, they're probably listening you know, more to us and trying to figure out what, right. of what we're doing here in North America right. is applicable to what could happen in Asia. I'm hoping for the day that they come to us and say, we found a, you know, a great new venue opportunity and we'd really like to give you our business plan to do that. Right. You know, we look at ticketing as another opportunity. You know, yeah. The ticketing market in Asia is completely wide, opening, wide right. open. And I think that because of our venue-based business, we'll be able to, be able to open our ticketing company here in the next couple of years. I know there's a couple of really important ticketing specialists that are actually here at All That Matters this week. But ladies and gentlemen, this has given you just some insight into what goes on inside the brain of Jay Marciano. Unfortunately, we have to come to a close on this today, but Jay, this has really been fascinating. And thank you so much for coming all the way from LA to impart all of this incredible knowledge, all of these years. How many, how many acts and shows do you think you've superintended over the 35 years you've been in the business? You know, I don't have much memorabilia, but what I do do is I keep my, my backstage passes yeah. from every show. And I throw it in a big box and that box is starting to like, <laughs> look pretty big. Yeah. I don't know what my kids are going to do with it. They'll probably sell it on eBay someday, but it mattered to me at the time. Sell it to the Smithsonian. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in giving Jay Marciano a wonderful, warm round of applause. Jay, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.